The Christmas story is, is more than a nice myth. It's more than a, a sentimental time to be with family. It's more than a, than a quaint manger scene you put somewhere in your house. God came because our lives were shrouded in darkness. And that darkness can only be dispelled by His presence. We're going to spend four sessions talking about names that God gave to Jesus through the prophet Isaiah some 800 years before Jesus came. These names encapsulate the essence of who Jesus is. They carry deep meaning that speak to the darkest and most broken parts of our hearts. Do you know Jesus as Emmanuel? Do you know him as wonderful counselor, as everlasting father, your redeemer, your restorer, your righteousness, your hope of heaven? You see, Jesus is all of these things in his very nature, but he won't be them to you until you believe on his name. This season is a bright sign pointing you to Jesus. Unto you, a child is born. Unto you, a son has been given. Will you receive him? Will you believe on his name?
Welcome to First Christian Church, a place where we hope all can connect to God's great love. We are excited that you joined us this Sunday. It's our second Sunday in the Advent season. Our theme this year is Home for Christmas. And although we are worshiping from our homes, Home for Christmas is more about preparing our hearts and minds to receive the true meaning of Christmas, the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ back home into our hearts. We have created these family advent boxes with opportunities for you to do that work this season. If you haven't picked one up yet, please comment below or call the church office and we would love to drop one on your porch. There are many things in there that we hope and pray will help you prepare your hearts and minds for this advent season. Two of those opportunities that we wanted to highlight this morning one is our open sanctuary on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout the month of December. Um, you can call and reserve a time to come and sit in the sanctuary with your family. This is something we have already experienced and we hope that you take advantage of that opportunity too. The ladies have decorated the church so beautifully. Um, there's prayers and music um, all for you to enjoy. The second is our Polar Express Drive-In that is open to everyone. Brinley has a few more details about that. Yes, I do. Um, Polar Express tickets, December 19th. The Polar Express train will leave at 6 45 to head to Jill and Ken Beck's to watch the Polar Express from the comfort of your cars. We hope that you join us that night. It is sure to be a night full of surprises and hopefully lots of joy. Those are just a few of the things that we have planned that you'll find inside your Advent box, but we wait hopeful um, and expectantly for God to have many more um, experiences and encounters throughout this Advent season that we never planned on. Before we go any further, if you would grab your Bibles, turn today to the book of Joel, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 12 through 13, 28 through 29. Did I forget anything else? I think you might have forgot communion, Mom. Don't forget your communion elements. Now, if you would, please bow your heads as we give our whole hearts to God in prayer. Lord, be with the preacher and her preaching today, and please bless our time in worship. Amen. Amen.
last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope, remembering the hope which comes in Christ. Today, we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. God has a peaceful dream for the world, and we dream it too. We dream of peace even in the midst of chaos and confusion. We dream of peace and confidence, faith and trust in God bring. We dream of a peaceful world where nations come together, where war is a memory, and we eat at one table. We light this candle in peace. On this day, we remember the Lord of all who brings peace surpassing all understanding. The song that you are about to hear is offered by a beautiful young woman by the name of Itzel. She is a friend of Logan's. Uh, the song that she sings is called Living Hope, and she offers the music uh, in Spanish. It speaks of the great mercy and grace of God that is offered to all and how that is our living hope, hope that never dies, that wells from within. It is a message that is relevant in any language, a message that was intended to be received by all. As you listen, may you hear in new ways the living hope offered to all.
Do we even know what it means to hope? Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and today I want to talk to you guys about hope. Yeah, because I, I feel like it's a really important topic in scripture, but it's also something that I think I think we really kind of misunderstand. Because I feel like we don't even know what the word hope means anymore. You know, sometimes sometimes words like change their meaning. That's just something that happens with, with language. It just sort of changes over time. Like, did you know that the word nice originally meant not so smart? Yeah, or awful used to mean amazing. Yeah, or terrific meant super scary. Now those words kind of almost mean the opposite. And I feel like the word hope is doing the same thing. Because the word hope means to expect something that you want to happen will happen. And I feel like it's almost backwards now. Like for me, if I make plans to go outside and play with my friends, but I see that there are storm clouds up ahead, I might say, oh man, I really hope it doesn't rain. Or I might say, oh man, I really hope we don't have a whole lot of homework this school year. When I say those things, really what I'm saying is, I don't want it to rain, but it probably will. Or I don't want a whole lot of homework, but we'll probably get a whole lot of homework. And that understanding of the word hope is like backwards of what hope is supposed to be. Hope is trust. If you hope that something will happen, it's supposed to mean that you want it to happen and you believe that it will happen. And so it's almost like we think that hope means you want something good to happen, but you expect something bad, which can be very confusing when the Bible says that we should put our hope in the Lord or that our God is the God of hope. Well, let me tell you something. God is not the God of wishful thinking. Our God, the one true God, is the God of fulfilled promises. That means when you put your hope in the Lord, you are believing that what he says is true. You're believing that he can do what he says he will do. You know, when someone makes you a promise, you, you have two choices. Either you can believe that they're going to keep their promise, or you can believe that they're not going to keep their promise. And if you believe that they're going to keep their promise, what you are doing is hoping. Now, it would be weird because if, if someone says, oh, I promise I'll do this thing for you, and you say, yeah, I hope you do, that almost sounds like you're saying, yeah, I don't think you will, but you better. But no, really, truly, the real kind of hope is an expectation for good. So putting your hope in Jesus Christ means that you believe that what he says is true, that he can do what he's promised. So when I say my hope is in the Lord, that's like skydiving kind of hope. You know, when somebody jumps out of a plane to go skydiving, I'm sure, I'm positive. I've never gone skydiving myself, but I'm positive that they check those parachutes at least twice, probably like four times to make sure that they will work when you jump out of that airplane. But when it comes right down to it, you don't know that it's gonna work. You can't prove that it's gonna work until you jump out of an airplane and pull, pull the chute. And you know, the truth is that hope and trust can be really hard for us because there is nothing on earth that you can fully trust other than Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that to say that we should never hope in anything. We should never trust anything. Because the fact is we hope in a lot of things. We put our trust in a whole lot of stuff even if you don't realize it. But I am saying that Jesus Christ is the only one ever, the only thing, the only person who will always, always keep his promises. Stuff lets us down. There are times where parachutes break, but our God is the God of fulfilled promises. We can trust in the Lord. We can put our hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in the Lord. And when it comes right down to it, Jesus Christ is our only hope. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would trust in the Lord that you would lean on him, that you would expect him to keep his word, because he will. Jesus said that if you believe in him, if you trust in him, then you will have eternal life. I have hope in Jesus Christ. And I have hope that I've been forgiven for my sins. And I have hope that one day he will come back and will make all things new, make everything right. And when I say I have hope, I'm not saying I really wish this would happen. I'm saying I believe it. I expect it. I trust it will happen. I have hope in the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we are meeting today in fellowship with one another, setting aside time solely for you, to offer you praise and worship, to hear you speak to us through Sandra, and to leave here shaped a little bit more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the times this week we've smiled and laughed, and for the times we've appreciated your beauty and Lord, for our days of difficulty and struggle, for times when we have been less than our best, we give you thanks. 
Thanks that you do not turn away from us, and thanks that we are never alone. We lift up our church today and every day. We want First Christian Church to be strong and vital in our community. We want to be used by you to make a difference in the lives of others. We lift to you our country and its leaders, along with our service men and women. We pray for your protection and presence in every decision that is made. And Lord, for those on our prayer list, you know their needs, and all those others who are sick, suffering, and lonely. We ask that you would envelop and touch them with your healing, your guidance, and most of all, your peace. Father, each of us have our own joys and concerns, which we lift to you now as we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions even on the male and female slaves. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. We are going to jump straight into scripture this morning because although this passage is short, it is not short on content. And I want to take 
full advantage of the time that we have to cover it. As you've heard me say often before we start to cover the scripture itself, we need to look at least briefly at some of the historical background and also the context in which the scripture was spoken. This is a text that is typically preached during Lent because it is a scripture that revolves around repentance. Um, the book of Joel opens with the prophet addressing a country in ruins. What's interesting is the destruction was caused not by a human enemy, but rather by an environmental crisis. The devastation had been sudden, and it had come unexpectedly. It had ravaged the land, the animals, the people, and all of their possessions. We don't know why it happened, but we do know that Judah felt they had absolutely nothing left. And this was especially concerning to those who believed in God because this was interpreted by them as God's judgment. And worse was the fact that they had nothing material left to offer in worship. They questioned how would they sacrifice without animals to sacrifice? How would they mourn without clothing to rip? How would they gather when there was no temple in which to gather? How would they repair their relationship with God when their traditional ways and methods of doing so were no longer available? Sound familiar? Um, I remember several years ago, I was getting ready to present the children with our new children's musical. I was so excited for them to listen to it, and I think I started with, this is the best musical yet. And little Caroline Harris, who was always bold in her statements, looked at me and said, Miss Sandra, you always say that. I was caught a little bit off guard, and yet realized what she said was true, and I said to her, Caroline, that is true, but is it not also true that that's always been the case? And her eyes lit up and a smile came across her face and she said, yes, yes it is. And we jumped right into that musical. I know that you've heard me say a multitude of times, this scripture is so relevant to what we're going through. It's so spot on for what we need to hear. I'm going to say it again. And just as I said to Caroline, I will say, it is still right and true. Will you pause with me as we open this time of studying God's Word with a time of prayer? God, I thank you for these who have gathered in untraditional ways. I thank you that they're here because they want to hear from you. I thank you that they're present because they want a word from you. And I thank you that even in these ways that we are so unaccustomed to, your spirit abides. I pray that you do the work that only the spirit can do. I pray that you teach, that you guide, that you convict, that you correct, and that you equip us for every purpose for which we are called to accomplish. Bless this time of studying your word and may it as you have promised us not return void in Jesus name we pray these things amen so Joel assures the people of Judah that worship is still possible but how we're going to look at what he said to the people knowing that I believe this is what God says to us as well. The first thing that he tells them to do is to return. But how do you return to God when the ways that you are familiar with doing that are gone? In ancient times, Advent was a season of repentance and fasting in the church. It differs, however, from Lent in that it doesn't focus on personal guilt and behaviors, but more on community faults and flaws. Advent's repent, Advent repentance is a turning away from cultural distractions and expectations that pull us away from our God center. Now, FCC has made very intentional efforts to help turn your hearts to God this Advent, to focus on the reason for the season and more than just catchy slogans, but to capture that meaning 
in our minds, and most importantly, in our hearts. Um, Joel's next word to the people is, rend your hearts. Now, I looked up the definition of the word rend, because that's not a word that we use often in communication these days, and the definition is to tear into, to wrench violently, to cause great emotional pain. It means to have hearts that are broken. Uh, the Hebrew word for heart is not just feelings. It's not that hallmark kind of emotion that we're all so familiar with this time of year, but it's a sign of sincerity, a symbol of the innermost part of a human being. In Hebrew, heart implies determination, purpose, and courage. And when we look at that in combination with what's happening, what we realize is it is determination that as focused and as right intentioned as it was, figures out it's off somehow. It's about purpose that has somehow gone astray. It's about courage that's been trampled on or shattered. Verse 12 invites us to weep and lament. It's interesting that the Bible says, even if you have nothing else to bring, that that would be enough. That was Joel's words to the people. If you bring your heart to God, that would be enough. You know, we're not expected to be happy holidays before God. We're expected to be open, honest, and vulnerable, not only with God, but with one another. I have a story that I want to share, and it's not my story, and I'm always a little hesitant about doing that because in the words of my wise friend, Terry Barnell, it's just not my story to share. This story uh, was shared with me earlier this week, and it was so spot on with this word, and um, to me, makes this word so applicable to everyday life, and so I did ask for permission to share it. Uh, the Shrednecks came on Friday after Thanksgiving to help prepare our music playlist for Open Sanctuary uh, for you to enjoy that experience. And as Ben put together the playlist and, and the hour of music for you to enjoy while you're in experiencing the sanctuary, they decided at the conclusion to turn on all of the, alight, the, all of the lights and experience what we were going to invite each one of you to experience. And as they did that and sat and soaked in the beauty of the sanctuary, sweet little Brindley broke out in tears. Um, she is so connected with this community, with, with God and with the church that it just broke her heart that this was not a place where she could gather on a weekly basis or on a regular basis like she had before. And um, as they dried her tears and tried to comfort her, as good parents do, Ashley said that she had the opportunity to share with her all of our Advent plans and the prayers and the intention and, and everything that had gone into being guided by God to um, do something in new and yet effective ways. And she said that she got to watch as Joy's, as Brenly's mourning uh, was replaced by joy and excitement. You know, it is okay to mourn what has been lost. Not just during this time of COVID, but even before church has changed traditions and practices that we valued in the past, they're no longer relevant or even accessible today. Things that we considered important are dying, have been dying for a long time. Things that we... Um, value and hold near and dear to our heart and we need to grieve the loss of those th things the same way that we would grieve the loss of someone that we loved. Um, it hurts and it's hard to imagine how we could ever go on. God says lay your heart before him. If we don't we become angry bitter and useless. But if we do, God binds up the broken and creates 
something new. We experience what Brinley experienced in the sanctuary with parents who love her and want the best for her. We have a God that does the same thing with us, who reminds us, I'm not inhibited by your ways or by the destruction that this earth experiences. I will accomplish my purpose and I allow you to be a part of what I will accomplish. You know, um, healing is for the church too. Death and resurrection, they are more than a story. It's real and it's relevant. And maybe in and through this, we have the opportunity to understand that truth more than we ever have before. You know, at the beginning of this experience, I read numerous posts from pastors who, right from the onset, experienced deep and heavy grief over not being able to be in their sanctuaries, not being able to host worship in the ways that they had always hosted worship. That wasn't my experience. Um, I got right to work with what do we do and how do we fix it and where do we go from here? Uh, that didn't happen for me until just recently after we had a large donation that enabled us to install the camera system that um, was going to enable our services to be just as meaningful if you were in worship live or if you were watching it virtually. Uh, we were so um, anxious about that first Sunday and yet at the end of that Sunday we were so excited that this was doable and this was going to work and we were going to step into Advent in ways that were so exciting only to find out the next day that the numbers had spiked to a point that we were going to have to step back again and go back into pre-recording services that for us that was the best decision to make. It was that day it was that Monday morning in the office when I uh, knew that that decision was the one that we were going to have to make that the tears began to flow. Um, I was devastated, and I remember telling God, I don't know how to do this. Like, how do we do an Advent season in this manner? How is it even possible to make this meaningful in the same way that it's been meaningful in the past? And I remember by the end of that day, that morning and that grief had been replaced by joy and excitement and enthusiasm in the things that God had provided and the inspiration and the excitement about what we could do and the potential about what could happen. You know, Scripture says, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. When our hearts are turned to God, it impacts not only our actions, but it increases our faith and our determination, our confidence in a God who does what he says he will do. I read this commentary from Working Preacher. If the people respond to Joel's call to return to God and rend their hearts in worship, they will be rewarded not necessarily with avoiding the day of the Lord, but with endurance to persist through the day of the Lord. Put in today's terms, that says this. When we follow the instruction of this scripture, when we turn to God, when we render our hearts to him, when we are broken for the ways that we fail to connect people to God, it doesn't remove the trials or the hard times or the tribulation, but it gives us strength, courage, and endurance to endure the trials and the tribulation. The passage goes on to say, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, he relents from punishing. That's enough, right? I mean, that's more than enough. But there's more. God rewards those who are obedient to these actions. We are to my favorite part. So buckle up and listen intently. Then afterwards, God's promises, God's part of the bargain. When we fulfill 
Our part is this. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Have you ever heard anything so powerful? Church, we have to grasp this. We have to gain understanding of this truth. We have to see what it says. I will pour out my spirit on all people. One commentary that I read said, um, there will be a time when God's spirit is poured out on all believers. No, that's not what this says. I'm taking it for what's written. Let's not change it because it's way too powerful. I will, says God, pour out my spirit on all flesh. When the church collectively turns our hearts towards God, is broken for the ways that we miss the mark or fail to connect others, God pours out his spirit on all flesh, not only the believers, not on some, not on the holy or the righteous or those who were obedient, but because of our obedience, God pours his spirit out on all. So what exactly is an outpouring of the Spirit and what does it accomplish? Let's not assume that everybody knows what the Spirit is or what the Spirit does because, let's be frank, the church has been somewhat negligent in talking about it because it's at times controversial. The Spirit was given to us when Jesus returned to be with the Father. The Spirit accomplishes the same things that Jesus accomplished when he walked this earth. The Spirit guides, it teaches, it comforts. The Spirit corrects and trains us in righteousness. It's in righteousness. The Spirit equips us to step fully into our purpose and to accomplish that purpose. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And don't we all know someone who needs an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Not just a sprinkle, but a really good soaking of the Holy Spirit. Well, get that person in mind and imagine that if you do your part, no, if we do our part, because it's bigger than that, God will do His. And there is more. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And we get scared by theological terms that we don't understand, but we shouldn't. To prophesy is to speak truth into a situation or a circumstance, to speak God's truth into the life of another. So some modern day examples would be for your daughters to speak to their friends at school. You have purpose. You were knit together by God in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are perfect exactly the way that you are. You are accepted. You are loved. You have value. You have meaning. For our sons to speak to their friend, I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've been told. I don't care how hard it's been. You are never alone. God is always by your side. He will equip you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. You have an amazing calling and purpose, and God will guide you into that as you seek his will for your life. When the church is doing their part. God promises to put words of life into our children, to speak into the world, into the broken world. Your old men will dream dreams. You know, dreams die. Excitement and enthusiasm for life fade, but not so when the church is doing what the church is supposed to do. And these aren't my words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Can you say amen? Your old men will dream dreams. They don't grow weary and faint. They will soar like eagles. That's God's promise. Wisdom, knowledge, and life experience combined with dreams. That's an unstoppable combination. And it's what God promises when the church is doing what the church is called to do. Your young men will see visions, hope, 
for the future, inspiration combined with a good plan on how to get there. That's God's promise for a community who has returned to God, rendered their hearts to Him. This, this is the reward, and this is great. On male and female slaves, I will pour out my spirit. You know, this one caught my attention. I read in a commentary that this was unheard of. So far from what was expected or accepted, you didn't talk about slaves, much less speak of them in this manner. If you were to think about this in today's terms, we might think of people caught up or bound by some force held captive, maybe by addiction or fear or anxiety or depression, loneliness, illness. The list could go on and on and on. But the promise of God is to pour out His Spirit on men and women, on young and old, even on those held captive by sin. Let's imagine this, guys teaching, correction, comfort, um, conviction that produces fruit. Fruit that looks like this, self-control that is poured out into the life of the addicted. Peace poured out onto the anxious mind. Love poured out into the hateful heart. Joy poured out onto the depressed. Patience poured out on Sandra because she needs it. Kindness poured out on the meanest person you can imagine. Gentleness poured out on the bully. And faithfulness poured out on the unfaithful. You know, early this week I was studying this passage and the Spirit prompted me to go back to the beginning. I did. And the first word caught my attention. Yet. I don't know how you're saying it, so maybe yet. Yet was my word from the leadership seminar last January. I didn't completely understand it then, and I don't completely understand it now, except to know that God gave me this word. Yet speaks to my role in this community. I was sharing that with Ashley, and she had a similar experience. Her word was effort. And both of us were amazed at the things that God was revealing to us through all of this. We closed our time with time of prayer, and I said the words, God, help us wholeheartedly serve you. And the tears welled. You know, I watched Brinley last week speak that line. She wholeheartedly, at least 20 times, God was calling us to serve together wholeheartedly before the word was preached this week. His ways of affirming, they are amazing. May we return to God. May we collectively render our hearts before Him. And may we receive every peace and part of the promises of God given to the people of God. Amen. For most of us, our Thanksgiving gatherings looked much different than in years past, and if current trends continue, it will most likely be the same with our Christmas gatherings, and yet there is a table that can never be shut down. And that is the table of God where all of the things that were highlighted in today's scripture become reality. Where we have the opportunity to lay our hearts before God, knowing that as we bring to him all of those things that keep us from being in right relationship with him, he binds our hearts and heals all that is broken. This is the table of God where through some incredible mystery, these elements provide for us a deeper connection with God. As you take them in, take time to remember how great the love was for you of the Father that he gave his life 
that you might live life eternal. When Christ gathered with the disciples in the upper room, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, it is for you. In the same manner, he poured out the cup, gave thanks, and said, this cup represents my blood spilled out for the forgiveness of all who will receive. As you eat of this bread and as you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Holy, 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 God of our mothers and fathers, God of Joel, God of Mary and Joseph. God, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We give thanks. We give thanks this day for this table where you welcome us over and over. As we eat this bread and drink this cup, we return to you with all of our hearts. Pour out your spirit on us. Accept our worry, our grief, our loneliness. Pour out your spirit. Dear God, this is our prayer today and every day. Surround us with your steadfast love. Pour out your spirit on us. Amen.
service today with a call to discipleship. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so. Yes, these are unconventional times and untraditional ways, and yet the invitation is always issued and you are always welcome. Call me and I'll do my best to walk you through that process. If you don't currently have a church body with whom you serve, we invite you into ours where all are truly Welcome, and finally a challenge to each and every one. May we, collectively as a body, return to God. May we render our hearts, and may we receive every reward. Amen. <laughs>